Ladies and gentlemen, so good morning uh, or good afternoon, good evening in case you're joining us online from Asia or Oceania. And a very warm, warm welcome uh, to the Royal Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, a new venue for us, but I think you'll, you'll appreciate it. It's an appropriate and auspicious venue uh, for this flagship uh, EU co-funded project that is PACE. So the PACE project, or Pathway to a Competitive European uh, Fuel Cell Micro CHP Market, the project started in June 2016. Uh, with the end of the project in just a few days, uh, which will mark a span of 83 months, so seven years um, and change, a period that included, in fact, two EU packages of policy proposals, uh, the clean energy package, and that's a distant memory for most people, and then, of course, more recently, the Fit for 55 package. Uh, as well, we had a global pandemic, COVID-19, floods in Europe, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, and the ensuing energy price security crisis, not to mention uh, the plethora of regional and national energy and climate policy initiatives that have taken place over that period as well. So it's fair to say that a lot has happened from the start to the end of the project. It's been a challenging period, but nevertheless, with the help of almost 34 million euro from the fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking, better known now as the Clean Hydrogen Partnership, matched with nearly 56 million euro in financial contributions uh, from our project uh, OEMs, uh, Bosch, Cedatec, uh, part of BD or Termea, Solid Era, and Wiesman, and supported by Element Energy, the Danish Technical University, DDTU, the Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts, the HLSU, and Cogen Europe, we embarked on a project to demonstrate the potential for fuel cell micro CHP as an efficient and reliable energy solution for homes and businesses and establish a market for this technology in Europe. In doing so, in those 83 months and still counting, we were able to sell and install over 2,500 units, closer to 2,600 fuel cell micro CHP units across Europe uh, focusing on, on 10, 10 EU member states uh, at the time, including the UK, so nine EU member states and the UK. Uh, 3,400 installers were trained in that period as well. The units themselves, we have uh, around 23 uh, million hours of operation uh, to learn from that experience and producing almost 24 million kilowatt of electricity produced in that period. So, over the course of today, you will hear uh, from the institutions that funded the project, directly from the representatives of the OEMs in a high-level panel discussion. We will hear directly from the work package leaders, uh, sharing quantitative and qualitative results after the networking lunch, and then followed uh, by a policy panel. And to wrap things up, we will celebrate the end, the close of the project with a user experience exhibition and networking contact, a networking cocktail. Um, and during the, uh, these moments of break, we will also have an opportunity to uh, experience and taste uh, products that are actually produced by fuel cell micro CHP users, uh, in particular from Belgium. So we have chocolates. All the chocolates that you have today are actually produced by a fuel cell micro CHP user. Uh, and for the reception, we also have uh, beer from a Belgium microbrewery also using fuel cell micro CHP. So, and in the exhibition, you will be able to, to hear and, and touch and feel uh, the, the units themselves. But we also have uh, videos from the OEMs as well as videos produced by the project interviewing uh, end users, uh, different applications, different technologies uh, and different countries. Um, now for some practical details, because I'm the first to speak. So clearly this is a hybrid event. Uh, in person, uh, we'll have anywhere between uh, 70 to 80 people coming and going throughout the day. Uh, and then we have close to 150 uh, people online joining from around the world. Uh, some people probably in their pajamas still. But that's the beauty of uh, being able to join from home. Uh, the event is being recorded. Uh, so recordings will be made available on the PACE website 
uh, after the event, including all the presentations before someone asks me. There are four Q&A sessions. Uh, there are two roving mics uh, in this room for the in-person attendees. You'll find them on the left and the right. Uh, uh, either the moderators or myself, and in the case of this keynote session, uh, will use the Q&A function in Zoom, so online participants can uh, write away their questions uh, as the speakers uh, present. Uh, and then myself or the moderators uh, will also field questions using the, the Q&A function on Zoom. And we'll be live tweeting and posting on LinkedIn throughout the event, so you can follow us uh, via the, the hashtag setting the pace. You see it in all the documentation. Uh, for your information, we also have a new electronic brochure uh, finalized last night, which is available for download. Uh, the QR code will be on the, the postcard that was distributed during registration, uh, allowing it, you to download it. A link will also be shared with participants online shortly, if not already. Other language versions of the brochure will be made available via the PACE website in the coming days. Uh, I believe there will be French, German, Dutch, and Italian. For the in-persons, there is Wi-Fi. There is, in fact, two Wi-Fi uh, networks running. It's free. You don't need to log in, uh, so you don't need to ask me for that. And if you can, please shut your phones to silent in order not to disturb uh, the participants. Uh, finally, I would like to also thank our media partners, the Cogeneration Channel, uh, NLIT Europe, and Power Engineering International for their support in promoting the event. Uh, and for their participation in the event today. Uh, many of you will be interviewed by the Cogeneration channel, and we also have one of the sessions uh, moderated by uh, uh, someone from Enlit Europe and Power Eng Engineering International. Uh, and it goes without saying that we are deeply thankful uh, for the support from the European Commission, uh, more specifically the FCHJU or the Clean Hydrogen Program. So it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speakers. Our first speaker will be Mirella Antanasio. I hope I said it correctly. She is currently the head of unit for operations and communications at the, the Clean Hydrogen Partnership. Uh, and she may not agree, but she is really a rock star in the stationary fuel cell research and innovation community. She was the project officer for Enfield, which was the predecessor of PACE. Uh, at the time, Enfield had been Europe's largest demonstration project for fuel cell-based micro-CHP, and over a thousand units were installed across Europe, uh, which ended in 2017. And Mirella was also heavily involved in the preparation for the call topic published in 2016, uh, large-scale demonstration uh, micro-CHP fuel cells, which resulted in PACE. So I'm very pleased to, to welcome to the stage uh, to listen to her keynote presentation. Thank you very much, Hans, for the kind and nice introduction. Uh, it, it's true, I feel nostalgic today, really, really. Um, I, 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 I'm happy that the project has finished, but I feel a bit pity that it has finished. I don't know, I have mixed feelings. So, um, really happy to be here with you today. Uh, when I heard about this event, I, I, I talked in, within my unit and I said that I could not miss it. So really, uh, thank you again for, for having me, for inviting me to be part of this uh, important event, the, the, the final event of, uh, of uh, PACE project. Um, you, you already said a few things which, which already set up somehow the tone for, for even for today's uh, event. This project uh, is one of the flagship projects indeed of the, of the GU, um, especially uh, within the, the, the energy applications, it is one of the, our important projects. Um, and um, in addition to, 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 to transport, uh, to the different other applications, and finally to the electrolyzers, I think it's one of our uh, success stories for the last uh, 15 years. So I have to say it, I hope I will not forget uh, saying good things about this project. Um, and now I will move to, to, to the presentation. For those that do not 
uh, know our JU, maybe uh, I will use the opportunity to, to talk a bit uh, about that. So who we are, uh, you, you also mentioned, Hans, that uh, the funding, in fact, comes from the European Commission, of course. Uh, because we are a public-private partnership between the, the, the European Commission representing the EU on the public side and the two private members, Hydrogen Europe and Hydrogen Europe Research, representing the, the industry currently with more than 400 members and the research community more than 100 members. Again, currently, uh, as of uh, 2021, end of 2021, we have received uh, for our third life, how I like to call it, um, 1 billion euro from the Horizon uh, Europe program, the research and innovation program of the European Commission, to continue to implement uh, solutions, um, uh, research and innovation, and develop research uh, uh, or do research and innovation and develop technologies, uh, hydrogen technologies. Um, and in addition, uh, last year, through the Repower EU communication, uh, of the European Commission, we have received 200 million uh, to just implement hydrogen valleys. Hydrogen valleys being recognized as one of the um, type of projects uh, that will push, uh, at least into the field, uh, the development of these technologies. Somehow, if you want, again, and how I like to say it, solving the chicken and egg problem, because you will have the production and the use in the same project. So being seen as such an important uh, mechanism or tool or instrument to, to, to push the hydrogen technologies into the market, like I said, we have received this uh, 200 additional million last year uh, to double the number of the valleys by 2025. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through the objectives. I just put them there for, for everybody's uh, understanding how ambitious we are uh, with, uh, with the 1 billion euro uh, funding. Uh, on, the, on the general objectives to show how we contribute to all the big policies from the Green Deal, hydrogen strategy, I mentioned Repower EU, and on the right side with, through the specific objectives, still working on, for example, uh, increasing the performance of the technologies, the durability, uh, while decreasing the cost, and ultimately, uh, I, I just want to mention a new objective uh, that we got, it's on uh, as, as the technologies on, on hydrogen are getting more and more uh, close to the, to the people, to the public, uh, including the ones uh, you know very well, uh, the challenges you had in Project PACE, um, we need to, to, to make sure that we increase, uh, we increase the awareness uh, and uh, finally the uptake, so that the, the people are convinced uh, finally even to, to buy the technology. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through all this, but the, uh, also to show you here um, the type of the activities, technologies, if you want, uh, sectors where uh, we will uh, spend our 1 billion euro, the funding. This is a schema of our strategic research and innovation agenda, uh, which is our strategic documents until 2027, uh, when is the last year when we will commit the funds. And uh, again, as you can see, it goes from production on the left side, mainly uh, electrolysis and of course only renewable hydrogen production. These are the technologies that we will develop. We don't say that uh, there will not be other technologies developed, uh, not only renewable, but our GU, as it contributes to the hydrogen strategy, it has to work on renewable hydrogen uh, technologies development. Then, uh, of course, on the distribution and storage, uh, we will continue looking at, uh, at transporting hydrogen from point A to point B. Uh, but uh, our ambition has increased in looking at big quantities of hydrogen that needs to be transported. And of course, moving to other types of technologies, not only, for example, compressed. Uh, we worked uh, a lot on, on, on compressed uh, storage and, and distribution. But now we will have to look at liquid for big, uh, big application or other carriers such as ammonia or liquid organic. Um, we will also have to continue to, to, to develop the technologies for the refueling uh, on, the, on the side of transportation. Uh, then on the end uses, uh, we will uh, continue to, to work on transport side, uh, on mainly on application for heavy duty 
uh, transportation. Uh, the, the previous JU has, uh, has worked uh, substantially on the road applications. That's how we started with cars, with buses. I think we have proven the technology there. We will not spend a lot of funding on these technologies. Of course, we will continue small demonstration for building blocks, how we call them, uh, for also for this type of technologies. But the focus on transportation will be on heavy duty, starting from the trucks, going to the trains, uh, ships and planes. Uh, and that, of course, in, uh, in, uh, in collaboration with some other parts of, of, uh, of the funding uh, in, in, uh, at EU level. And then uh, what is uh, important for the scope of the meeting today, we will continue supporting also stationary fuel cells. But again, uh, similarly, like on the transport side, we will look at, I think, having successes like Enfield you mentioned, or PACE, I think now we will have to focus our uh, research and innovation money just uh, on um, improving the technology so that it is flexible, if you want, on the side of uh, admixtures. We know how our hydrogen ecosystems will, will, uh, ecosystem will look. Uh, we know that um, on a shorter term or on a longer term, we will have to deal with uh, hydrogen into the natural gas grid. So the systems have to be able to work on that. So this is the type of, of research that we will still continue to support or moving into 100% uh, hydrogen uh, ready uh, systems. Uh, we will also work on, uh, when we talk about stationary fuel cell, on uh, adaptation to the new carriers I mentioned. For example, ammonia fuel cells or fuel cell working on ammonia. Uh, and then uh, with these new challenges on the, on the side of, of uh, transportation or distribution, uh, we will have to, to look at other end uses. And we have opened uh, our program in terms of uh, heat and power also to uh, boilers, burners, and turbines. That we have not supported in the previous program. And now the current program, uh, it also opens to this type of um, uh, technologies, not only for heat and power, but also for uh, exploring such solution, also in synergies with the transport applications. We know again that for planes, we may have to have a hybrid system between a fuel cell and a turbine. Uh, so these are the type of uh, opening in our, in our program. And finally, of course, on the cross-cutting, the last column you see on the right, uh, we will continue to work on safety, sustainability. And when I say sustainability, it's, uh, it's, it's um, again preparing and developing technologies that in 10, 15 years will not cause problems in terms of recycling. So we need to uh, do uh, sustainability by design whenever we develop new technologies. And we have to look from the, from the, from the materials development uh, until the, the entire system, how these uh, systems, uh, these, these technologies, these solutions will be uh, sustainable. And of course, also on the right, you see the, the valleys. The valleys, uh, it's something we, we, like I said, started to, to, to initiate in 20, uh, 2017, starting working with the regions and first valley funded in 2019. And we will have now to, to, to try to spread them across Europe so that uh, we have a bit of uh, take, uh, off takers, uh, use of hydrogen production, but also use of hydrogen across Europe with such projects. I already mentioned the other activities, so we do not only support projects, uh, across the value chain, like I just explained before, but uh, we also do many, many other activities. And in supporting that, uh, of course, uh, we have to work in synergies, especially for leveraging different other source of funding or financing. Funding either uh, from Horizon Europe, from the, from the research program, but also from uh, programs such as CEF, Connecting Euro Facility. Uh, where we uh, collaborate uh, for uh, building the network of the refueling stations um, together with the vehicles. So again, we have the, the chicken and egg problem somehow solved, working in synergies with other funding programs, or like is the case of the valleys, uh, uh, synergies with uh, local funds, structural funds, regional funds. 
there is where we work together with the regional actors, municipalities, uh, cities, uh, in order to leverage the, the, the additional funding for the benefits, of course, of the, of the locals. Uh, and uh, finally, we will uh, also continue to support our um, public partner, European Commission, uh, in the international cooperation. And uh, for that, I just want to mention we will, uh, on the 8th of May, uh, very soon, in less than two weeks, uh, relaunch the Hydrogen Valley platform, uh, where we will try to map all the valleys currently, all the valleys across the world. Uh, right now we have 37, uh, and we hope to, to reach almost 100. Uh, of course, I mentioned we don't, we have not started in 2021, we have a legacy, we have plenty of projects that we support it, again, across the value chain, we will not go through. Um, it is a 50 years uh, journey. Uh, I just selected a few, few, few um, photos and, and some words to show the loop. It's a loop, although it's, it doesn't look like, but it's, it's, it's really a loop starting from fundamental research, materials research for developing cells, for fuel cells, for electrolyzers, uh, but then putting the different building blocks, uh, going into the field, into the demonstration, proof of concepts, validation, and then going back uh, for the next generation of products. So that's what we did in 15 years. And uh, you, can, you can see it through the project Senefield and Pace, um, how we have also uh, brought the, 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 the products into the, into the market with such an approach. Yes, I'm coming and I'm, I'm approaching the end of my talk. Uh, on, on clean heat and power, uh, you see the number on the left, 81 projects. It's a lot out of the almost 300, so it's almost, what, uh, a fourth of the program. Because we started stationary fuel cell where uh, one of the main applications that we look at uh, 15 years ago. Um, and it evolved. Uh, we, we did not only have projects like Enfield or, or PACE on MicroCHP. We also had uh, projects uh, testing uh, big, bigger sizes of the systems, uh, uh, up to 20 kilowatt and even the megawatt in, in some uh, stationary fuel cells in some projects. But in addition to that, we had other projects accompanying them and preparing the technology somehow, or like I said, doing this feedback loop where you look at the look at the technology, how it performs into the field, learn and go back to the lab and uh, improve it. Uh, and again, you will hear probably today through the, through the agenda how the different uh, generation of products, even in, 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 in project pace, have evolved with such a, such a uh, approach. Um, and uh, this is really my last slide. Uh, for the domestic uh, heat and power, uh, Hans, you already mentioned, I think PACE has played a very important role. Uh, I show also, I chose to show an F field. We had also a small project even before that. It was called Softpack. I think these systems do not even exist anymore, uh, but they have evolved in other type of systems. And of course, uh, proud to see during the project even that some national programs have taken over and complemented our funding, like the KFW in, in Germany. And also we know some, some initiative in Belgium from where the brewery things and the chocolate things are coming. Um, so again, uh, proud of, about, this, uh, the, about this project, proud about how uh, we have brought the technology into the market one of the success stories of, uh, of the GU and really uh, nostalgic and proud to be here. Really, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mirella. Again, the rock star, the rock star of stationary fuel cell research and innovation. And she continues. So uh, thank you very much, Mirella, for your intervention. And uh, we'll go to our, our second and last keynote speaker from the European Commission. So I'm very pleased to, to invite Jeroen Schrippers, who is the Deputy Head of Unit uh, for the Clean Energy Transition Unit, coming from the Director General for, for Research and Innovation from the European Commission. So please welcome Jeroen to the floor. <clears throat> Thank 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Interesting to hear that uh, fuel cells are nowadays used to produce chocolate and beer, which uh, I think is a very good application of, uh, of technology. Uh, many thanks for inviting us. Um, I have to apologize for uh, my director, Ms. Rosalinda van der Vlies, who was initially supposed to be here, but she couldn't be here with uh, you today. So I was asked only yesterday to replace her, and this explains why I don't have a presentation, but I will be just speaking to you. So I hope you will be able to follow me. Um, as Mirella has said, uh, BASE is uh, one of the flagship projects from the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking. Um, and I would like to start with congratulating the consortium with uh, finalizing this important project. Uh, this is a, a huge project and I know from uh, overlooking many projects in the past myself how difficult such large projects can be to manage and to bring to a successful end. Um, this uh, innovation uh, in PACE will empower citizens to be active participants in the EU clean energy transition by bringing fuel cells in their homes. Uh, this transition cannot be achieved without decarbonizing our buildings because buildings are responsible for more than a third of our CO2 emissions and almost three quarters of the buildings that we have are not energy efficient and they are heated very often using fossil fuels in the conventional way like in my home. Uh, so making buildings more energy efficient is a key part of our plans to climate neutrality by 2050. CHP and micro CHP for that matter as well offer energy efficiency, security, but also decarbonization benefits in particular if they use renewable feedstock. Um, Horizon Europe supports research and innovation on biomass CHP in our normal work program to increase its technical performance the cost efficiency and the sustainability uh, and the integration with other renewable energy technologies. Important for the whole clean energy transformation of the heating and cooling sector as a whole is that we can introduce renewable gases like biomethane and hydrogen to replace the fossil fuels, which is one of our political drivers, obviously, because Repower EU, uh, a recent uh, policy driver with its uh, biomethane action plan and a hydrogen accelerator uh, aim to increase substantially the shares of biomethane and hydrogen in our economy by 2030. And both biomethane and hydrogen can be used in to power micro CHP in residential fuel cells as well. Um, the Clean Hydrogen Partnership, as Mirella explained, uh, the follow-up of the fuel cells uh, uh, and hydrogen joint undertaking very much supports this transition to hydrogen. Um, the large-scale rollout of fuel cells is an important enabler to achieve climate neutrality. Um, the base project, with its large rollout of micro CHP fuel cells, will have an, an impact in the decarbonisation of the building sector. And this will also help, therefore, to facilitate in due time the shift from fossil fuels to renewable hydrogen. I'd like to dwell a little bit more on our hydrogen strategies, what we do in the European Union on hydrogen. It plays, as you know, a, a key role in the EU's clean energy transition, not only to fight climate change, but also to end our dependence on Russian fossil fuels. Um, and this is, of course, at the moment, one of the main policy drivers. Uh, renewable hydrogen can be used to store renewable energy, which is for us very important. Um, it is, of course, a chemical feedstock. It can be used to produce steel, uh, replacing coal in the direct reduction of iron, and as a fuel in transport, and as explained by Mirella, largely for those sectors of transport that are hard to electrify, like maritime, rail. Uh, well, rail, you have other options, but for long-haul transport, for example. Um, for some of these sectors, hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives uh, are the only decarbonization option, and without such zero emission steel production and chemicals and fuels using hydrogen, uh, we will not be able to reach our goals. But we now have a momentum at this moment to, and an opportunity, I would say, to move to renewable hydrogen from niche to scale to, to bring our economy, hydrogen economy from niche to scale. Um, we have that because Repower EU proposes very ambitious targets, as you know, 10 million tonnes per year of renewable hydrogen production domestically 
and 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen imports all by 2030. This will hopefully scale up rapidly a European clean hydrogen economy. But there are a number of obstacles, obviously. Uh, first of all, it's more expensive than fossil fuels. It's even more expensive than grey hydrogen. Uh, and there is also very little transport and storage infrastructure at the moment. And this is the strength of the hydrogen valleys. Mirella already explained this. The, it can solve the chicken and egg problem between supply and demand and between investments in production on the one hand and investments in infrastructure on the other hand. Hydrogen valleys, they do that by creating local or, or even regional ecosystems where you bring producers and consumers together. And by clustering the demand, for example, in having different off-takers like an industry, a steel plant or a chemical plant or transport sector or uh, domestic use or commercial use in buildings or in injecting it in the gas grid, gas grid you get a cluster of uh, off-takers that increases the business case for the producers. Um, apart from that, they share, of course, experience and infrastructure and you use economies of scale which um, uh, strengthens further the business case and which can make hydrogen valleys the stepping stones, you could say, to a hydrogen market formation. And on 1st March this year, uh, our Commissioner Gabriel, Commissioner for Research and Innovation, opened uh, here in Brussels a high-level event, which was called Repowering the EU with Hydrogen Valleys, where we gathered about 300 leading stakeholders from the hydrogen community in Europe, both from industry and researchers and from the policy side and the political side. And at this occasion, the Commissioner signed a joint declaration together with representatives from the industry, Horizon, uh, Hydrogen Europe, from the research community, Hydrogen Europe Research, and from the European regions. And in this declaration, they underlined to encourage continuous investments in research and innovation, to promote collaboration between funding resources, the different funding resources that Mirella already mentioned, to share knowledge, to strengthen education and training for skills, and to call for regional hydrogen networks and interconnections between those hydrogen valleys. This education and skills, I should underline, is very important for the Commission as well and for Europe because it will be crucial in preparing the human resources that we need for a competitive European hydrogen industry. And uh, we already spent recently 4 million under Erasmus Plus to select 19 core job profiles in hydrogen and to define the requirements for their curriculum. And in addition, the Clean Hydrogen Joint Undertaking will support this year a call for a European Hydrogen Academy. And I think these are very important steps forward. Apart from this, I should mention the open innovation testbeds that we open in our Cluster 5 Horizon Europe work program uh, on, horizon, on hydrogen production to help innovators and in particular SMEs to test and to improve their technologies and their products and bring them to the market. So hydrogen valleys, in short, now will stimulate local economy and also provide opportunities for citizens to be involved in uh, using uh, renewable hydrogen and based on the availability of local resources. Now, finally, let me say a few words on our general research and innovation policy update. Um, the Green Deal was already mentioned, very ambitious objectives to tackle the climate challenge and the clean energy transition is at the centerpiece uh, of this Green Deal. And Repower EU has taken that to a next level. Um, Repower EU, if you read it, the attention goes to energy security. Um, it puts it energy security at the top of the agenda, but we should realize that security concerns cannot be seen apart from affordability and sustainability. The Green Deal will still remain the common answer. And research and innovation is critical for delivering the solutions and system transformations that we need. Important is to mainstream in our technology development the, the aspects of sustainability and circularity throughout this. And as, uh, another issue that we must mainstream, and it's getting more and more important, is to regain and maintain our leadership and technology sovereignty on novel materials because we are challenged by our international competitors in Asia and in the US on this and we need to have 
innovative solutions for new materials to replace the critical raw materials and to increase our independence on natural resources. So our R&I activities in Horizon Europe uh, play an important role to finding solutions, finding new materials, but also to look at issues like recyclability and circularity of equipment, for example, fuel cells, but also batteries, solar cells, and components of wind turbines, for example. So on the 16th of March this year, uh, the Commission published, as part of the Green Deal Industrial Plan, the so-called uh, Critical Raw Materials Act and the Net Zero Industry Act. And both these acts aim to uh, increase our autonomy uh, in the manufacturing of net zero technologies and in the sourcing of raw materials. Uh, the Net Zero Industry Act uh, stipulates that by 2030, um, the, the net zero technology manufacturing capacity in the Union should reach 40% of our annual deployment needs for that particular or a particular technology. And fuel cells are seen in that Net Zero Act as a net zero strategic technology. The second act, the Critical Raw Materials Act, will ensure or should ensure that Europe has sufficient access to materials like rare earths uh, and those materials are vital for the manufacturing technologies for the green transition. So these new political objectives uh, you could say are setting out new goalposts for research and innovation to boost the manufacturing of renewable energy technologies and ensure that circularity by design will become the new paradigm. And on many of these strategic technologies, we have established Horizon Europe partnerships, both with the public side and with the private side, um, where we set up strategic research agendas in a common effort and where we try to leverage the funding. Uh, the Clean Hydrogen Partnership is, is a prime example, of course, uh, leveraging uh, funding with the private side and with the researchers, one billion from EU. Horizon Europe added with the 200 million from Repower EU to at least double the number of hydrogen valleys in the EU. Another example is the Clean Energy Transition Partnership, which is a so-called co-funded partnership with member states only, where the Commission provides only 30% of the funding and the member states provide 70%. We have put more than 200 million euros into that and the member states have pulled together 600 million from their national budgets into this co-funded partnership. So that shows the enormous leverage effect that we can achieve this. And then last but not least, another example is co-program partnerships. Uh, for example, the, the, uh, the European Partnership on People-Centric Sustainable Built Environment, the Built for People, uh, where we draft research programs together with the industry. It's a co-creation space uh, to, to uh, based on holistic view, I should say, uh, of the built environment for sustainability against circularity and improving living conditions. Um, as a final piece of information, I would leave with you that on May 23rd, next May 23rd, uh, DG Research and Innovation will organize an information event here in Brussels, a hybrid event uh, on the financial and business opportunities beyond Horizon Europe, which can support the market uptake of technologies and systems. And the program will include uh, presentations from the Innovation Fund, the European Investment Bank, the Connecting Europe Facility, and the European Innovation Council. So to conclude, uh, again, my congratulations to the PACE project and to the consortium for bringing this to an end. And I'm wishing you an interesting conference with a lot of fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeroen, for your intervention. We have a little bit time uh, before we have to close this session and go to the coffee break. But I, I think, Mirella, you have five, ten minutes before you have to rush off to your next event. So I have colleagues in the room with microphones. Uh, so if there are any questions uh, from the floor, this is your opportunity to, to address uh, our, our keynote speakers. Uh, I'm looking at the chat function uh, online and we don't have any questions yet. So um, this is your chance. Uh, we have a question in the middle. And if my colleagues in the back could provide us with a roving mic to answer the questions. Thank you very much. Hi. 
Uh, my, I'm Nicholas Thorell from Element Energy. My question is, is to you, um, Mirella. Is to what extent is 100% conversion um, of the existing natural gas rate to hydrogen considered in these hydrogen values that values that are mentioned? Okay, thank you, Hans. So, to repeat, to, to be sure I got it uh, right. So, to what extent in the valleys? we look at 100% conversion of the hydrogen or of the pipelines? Y yes, exactly. Well, I, think, I, I think there is no such requirement in the valleys. Uh, I think uh, we can go uh, for uh, repurposing, which could be that, or even building new pipelines. I think we had one of the topics of this year call, call 2023, that just closed a uh, few, uh, last week. I forgot what day is it, it is today. Um, so it just closed last week. Uh, it, one of the topics there was uh, looking for demonstration. Uh, it was a type of a flagship project, not necessarily a valley. Well, a valley, it's a flag, flash, flagship project, so like a demonstration project, where we wanted to look at uh, building new pipelines of hydrogen. So, of course, we have to align ourselves to the policy. And this is where we talk with our colleagues from DGNR. Uh, when we, whatever we do, supporting projects or uh, develop as new technologies, it has to fit with the technology, uh, with the policy, sorry. So, um, as far as uh, we know, uh, at least in the policies developed uh, by the NR, uh, energy colleagues in the Commission, uh, they uh, would like us to work first on technologies that go up to 20% into the, into the natural gas. We know why, because we have the standards and the type of the materials in the, in the pipelines that allow that. Or either look at repurposing where it's an economical value better than building new ones. But we are open shortly to answer to your question, although I did it long. Um, we are open for all. Uh, in, in the valleys, there is no such requirement for any type of technology. Thank you very much. Any other questions? In the back? Uh, hello, my name is Alexi van der Oermeer. I was wondering, um, with the recent breakthrough in uh, nuclear fusion, will at some point uh, hydrogen be irrelevant? I'm personally a big fan of hydrogen, but I saw that in the, I think it was in the United States, that they made a huge breakthrough in uh, nuclear um, fusion. So if that comes once one day in the future more, um, sustainable, do you think that hydrogen will not be relevant also fossil fuels, but hydrogen in general? I mentioned at the beginning, we, uh, we look at renewable hydrogen. Of course, you may challenge what it is renewable. Um, according to the hydrogen strategy, it does not contain yet hydrogen produced from nuclear. We know US has a different approach. And US looks even at uh, the, C the SMR, the steam methane reforming, for producing hydrogen. So they still look at gray. Uh, so of course, they, they, uh, we have another uh, policy here in Europe than US. Huh? We are not neglecting the technology that produces hydrogen from nuclear. Uh, but uh, when we talk about funding and research and innovation in Europe, for now, complying with the hydrogen strategy, we do not consider hydrogen from nuclear. We are not saying if a breakthrough, I don't know, then I leave it up to the commission to change the policy, but <laughs> we, as I said, we comply with the policy in the commission and so far we don't look at that. Yeah, just to complement on this, uh, my simple answer would be that um, uh, if fusion would become a reality, then that in many years from now, that would not mean, uh, that, well, that could mean that it would make many 
energy technologies obsolete, uh, but that does not mean that we stop, should not support those technologies at this moment. We are very technology neutral as a commission in our research portfolio. Uh, we support different technologies. Euratom supports uh, nuclear uh, research, but as Mira said, for hydrogen at the moment, the research need now is on renewable hydrogen. So this is what we will continue to support. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think that's all the time we have. We do have one question online, but I will save it because I think it's more appropriate to, to address towards the, the OEMs. Unless I've missed a... Oh, there's one more question. I think we have time for one more question. So it's, it's about... Hello? Can you hear me? Ah, okay. It's about the supply of hydrogen and... Uh, of course, we all want green hydrogen made of surplus uh, electricity uh, made by renewables. But I think uh, this will last quite a few years until this is available in large quantities, simply because first uh, cheaper methods uh, to, to use this extra electricity by fuel cells and also heat pumps or so, uh, and, and electric vehicles um, are, are more available. And therefore, until larger plants uh, from, from electrolysis and, and uh, similar uh, further uh, manufacturing of, of uh, der derivative fuels will, will quite last a little bit. So the question is, okay, how far is in the mind of the Commission and also in the hydro um, um, uh, gen associations uh, to just import uh, the hydrogen made of natural gas from Norway and they keep the CCS and, and, and store it somewhere there in the underground as a, as a kind of bridging fuel. Yeah, this is a question that comes back very often. Uh, what about blue hydrogen, as you, you, you call it? And the answer there again is uh, we do not support the production of blue hydrogen because the production of that hydrogen itself through steam methane reforming is already 50 years old. But you need carbon capture and storage, permanent storage, to make it really CO2 neutral. And this is what we support as a, as a European Union in a research program. So from a research aspect, we support CCS to decarbonize that production because then hydrogen production is an industrial process. The member states have their own um, prerogative of, some, of uh, choosing the energy mix. So if they want to import hydrogen that is made from natural gas, then this is going to happen. And this is going to happen already now. Um, hydrogen valleys, uh, the production part that we support is renewable hydrogen. But that does not mean that it cannot be mixed with other forms of hydrogen. It will be. Huh? So this is indeed uh, blue hydrogen as it is right now. And even grey hydrogen is a stepping stone towards a hydrogen economy, which will be gradually taken taken over by renewable hydrogen. That is at least the ambition that we have. All right, thank you. So if you uh, would join me and uh, thank our keynote speakers one uh, last time, uh, and then we'll go to a coffee break and we will be back at 11.45.